the moderator of the next session, Nick Gowing. Okay, good afternoon again. Um, we're really, I think, continuing the spirit of the last discussion uh, about Russia and the West, but broadening it out into the issue of me first. And we're going to hear a definition or a, a suggestion of what me first really means in a moment. Uh, but first, let me introduce um, Ambassador Greminger, who is uh, from the OSCE. Welcome. Uh, we have Ambassador Nemenzia. Uh, who is the permanent representative of the Russian Federation uh, at the United Nations uh, in New York. And uh, in the middle, Sir Mark Lyle Grant, who until 15 months ago was the British uh, National Security Advisor, and before that, the uh, UK permanent representative to the United Nations. So we've got three panelists who've been monitoring, and uh, um, uh, Ambassador Nebenzia was a Deputy Foreign Minister for the Russian Federation beforehand. So we've got significant ideas about how the change, the challenge, and the eliding, and the change of uh, nature of the institutions and respect for institutions is happening. That's the basis on which we're going to do this for the next hour and a half. Please, if you'd like to, use this. Or alternatively, um, I'll just come to you and say who would like to come in. But don't assume it's going to be questions at the end. Think about this as a conversation, even in uh, this Danube space, which fortunately is not being blown around or rained on this afternoon. So um, w the sound is good and uh, conditions are good as well. But before we get going, uh, or to get us going, I'd like to introduce uh, again uh, Foreign Minister Lajcek uh, from Slovakia, who is also, of course, as you know, as he uh, underscored this morning, the president of the UN General Assembly. Uh, I should uh, make a declaration that he's uh, asked me to be a, uh, an advisor on, on leadership uh, uh, with a n number of other people as well uh, in New York, and we meet from time to time. So let me introduce uh, Foreign Minister Lajcek. Thank you, Nick. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm standing here for one main reason. I want to call for a multilateral renaissance. Our main multilateral body, the United Nations, was created in 1945, more than 70 years ago. And a lot of change has happened since then. Some has been shocking, like the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989, or the 9-11 terror attacks in New York, or the financial crisis in 2008. And some have happened in more subtle ways. War started to be fought more within than across borders. News began to spread from newspapers to smartphone screens. Globalization sped up, and technology transformed almost every part of our lives, from what we eat to how we communicate. With these changes have come new challenges. Challenges I do not think we could have imagined 70 or even 10 years ago. Now we have a planet that is melting around us. We have conflicts with no end in sight. We have threats of nuclear war hanging in the air. We have seen hatred push out humanity. We have watched inequality grow. And we have had to adjust to the reality that a terror attack could hit anywhere and at any time. We use different words to describe these challenges. Daunting, concerning, alarming, but actually they are simply scary. We are scared. We just don't like admitting it. Maybe, however, it's time to start calling a spade a spade. There are red warning lights flashing. There are threats on the horizon. And we are all looking for a way to respond. But as, as far as I can see, we have the solutions right in front of us. All the tools are there in our multilateral toolbox. We just need to start using them properly. That's why we need a renaissance, a rebirth, a revival. 
a move back to basics, but with new passion and commitment. And I want to suggest a few different ways how this could happen. First, I believe there must be a cultural shift. As the saying goes, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And when it comes to multilateralism, there is some room for improvement. And here I want to focus, in particular, on how we talk to and engage with each other. Because dialogue is at the core of multilateralism. It is the most basic, but the most powerful tool in our toolbox. And frankly, we need to dust it down and start using it again. And I'm talking about the real dialogue, the kind that happens between people, the kind that can go in unexpected direction, the kind that sparks new ideas and new perspectives. And this is not as common as we might think. Too often we choose monologue over dialogue, prepared scripts over real interaction, rhetoric over recommendations. And sometimes it's not only how we say it, but also why. And this must also be part of our cultural shift. Are we talking just to talk? Are we negotiating just to negotiate? Do we want to be seen to be engaging? Or do we really believe in the end goal? Do we want to achieve tangible results? And in talking about how and why we engage, I want to be very clear. Multilateralism is not here to mirror our own priorities. It is not here to further our own goals. It is not here to make each of us feel like we have won every time. That's not its job. That's not why we created it. It is here so that we can all win over the long term, even if that means that we have to make individual compromises, even if we have to move more towards the middle. And that's a concept we can understand because many of our biggest successes have been based on compromise, solidarity, and reciprocity. Just look at the European Union. Years ago, the idea of the single market was hotly debated, and it was not simply a win-win. And to make it work, there have been both benefits and compromises. If we want a barrier lifted, we need to bring down one of our own. If we want concessions, we need to offer them to others. And if we want to benefit, we need to allow others to do so too. We all bought into this, and it transformed our continent. Yet, we have been slower to apply this to our foreign policy. Instead, we, the members of the international community, have set red lines. We have often come to the table determined not to give anything away. We have sometimes failed to realize that if multilateralism wins, we all win. Or that me first policy might work for one at first, but overall we all lose out. We created our multilateral system for a reason. We made it for real dialogue, real engagement, real compromise, and real results for all, not just one. It is capable of delivering. It can produce solutions, but only if we use it the right way. So we need a shift. And my second point is that we need this shift to come from the top and the ground. The gap between institutions and the people they are there to serve is getting bigger. This is no secret. And it is leading to confusion and disillusion and cynicism. We need to clo close this gap and to do so fast. It does not matter how much good is being done if people do not know about it. And when it comes to the United Nations, good work really is being done. Its humanitarian operations are often the first to reach those in dire need. Its missions on the ground are working to protect civilians and to keep the fragile peace together. Its development partnerships are helping to transform societies. And it has been the birthplace of some of the most important frameworks of our time, from the Universal Declaration on Human Rights to the Sustainable Development Goals. But we don't always hear this side of the story. There are bubbles around our institutions, and they need to be popped by those of us already inside. Think about our history. 
Think about the times when people have come together for change. Mostly it has been led by leaders with a vision. Leaders who could relate to people. And leaders who use the same language as everyone else. Somehow I do not think we can achieve the same results with scripted statements from inside buildings with restricted access. But the shift cannot be top-down only. We also need ideas, perspectives, and solutions from the ground. It is hard to have a finger on the pulse from Brussels, Geneva, or New York. That's why we need to listen to those closer to the action. And that's the only way we can stop being taken by surprise. We have repeatedly failed to anticipate major shocks and crises, and we have been left responding rather than preventing crises. This has been seen from the spike in migrant and refugees flows to the deepening crisis in the Middle East. But although we might have been taken by surprise, others on the ground were not. They had seen the warning lights flashing, and they had felt the tremors in the ground. I have used my presidency to call for a stronger focus on people, <clears throat> not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's a smart thing to do. Our multilateral institutions were built for people, not bureaucrats, not diplomats, not dignitaries, but people. If we lose sight of that, we lose sight of our overall mission, and we are left in the dark with no capacity to act earlier and faster to prevent rather than to react to conflicts and crises. This must all be part of our multilateral renaissance. And the United Nations must be at its epicenter because this body is the lifeblood, the vital organ to our multilateral system. It gives us the biggest, most inclusive stage. We cannot, however, ignore all the other actors on the stage too, national stakeholders, civil society, academia, businesses, and regional organizations. And for my third and last point, I want to focus on the last group, the regional organizations, and in particular, the European Union. Its work is felt not only by European citizens, but millions of others around the world. And it is a crucial part of our multilateral system. In fact, there is a whole chapter in the United Nations Charter, namely Chapter 8, dedicated to regional actors. In many cases, the United Nations and the European Union are working towards the same goal. Just read through the priorities in the European Union's global strategy. You will find peace building, conflict prevention, mediation, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, prevention of violent extremism, addressing climate change, and promoting human rights. These are also at the top of the United Nations priority list. So the European Union and the United Nations really should be working in a very close and very integrated partnership. But this is not always the case, at least at the policy level. And I see more opportunity at the United Nations General Assembly. The European Union does engage and in fact, its representatives are very active in the Assembly's processes and negotiations. But I believe there is scope to ramp this up. If we want to bring about a multilateral renaissance, we need the European Union to speak up louder than ever on the international stage. Excellencies, dear friends, I am delighted that we are focusing on multilateralism today, that we have a chance to remind ourselves of why we created the United Nations in 1945, and to call out the risk of moving away from it towards a me-first world. But let me stress one thing. Multilateralism is not black or white. We might see something as right or as wrong, but someone else might ar argue a different case. And what do we do then? Clear and blatant violations of international law are taking place as we speak. And we must be brave enough to tackle this heads on. And we need to condemn them without reservation. But we cannot end there. We cannot only call out, only criticize, only condemn. 
This is not how we reach the goals we set in 1945. We must look for solutions. We must think outside the box. We must look at the facts now, but also look ahead to the future. And that's why dialogue was the key message at the start of my statement. And that's why I want to end on the same note, because it's at the core of every single issue of our agenda today. Finally, before I conclude, I want to point something out. We have some great thinkers and practitioners here in this room and in this conference today. But together, we do not represent all of the people our multilateral system is here to serve. Most are not in the room. They do not sit in our meetings in Brussels or in New York. And they do not get to raise their voice from podiums like this one. So if we want a multilateral renaissance, it can start in here, but it cannot stay here. Instead, we need to gather the ideas and perspectives we gain in here, and we need to bring them out there to spark discussions, to balance the narrative, to mobilize, to inspire, and to ensure that we all have the tools to stand up and speak out for the system we have spent, spent more than 70 years building. The system we cannot afford to weaken, and the system we need now more than ever. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Mr. Lechak. Um Right, we've got, uh, we've got, we're into 90 minutes, we've got 75 minutes. Uh, to create that multinational, multinational, multilateral renaissance. Now, first of all, I should tell you that this is going out on Facebook Live. Secondly, do please use that if you want to. Um, I'll be switched on uh, and monitoring anything you want to say as you're hearing uh, any of the panelists speak. But I think I need to lay that challenge to you. And what, the, what we've heard twice now uh, from this podium since 12 o'clock today is the issue of, um, of me first and also the urgency, and you're hearing it not just from the Slovak foreign minister, but the president of the UN General Assembly. And I've heard him three weeks ago, alongside Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, saying exactly the same thing. This cannot go on. So there's a challenge here. I'm not writing notes particularly of this, but I'd like to lay the challenge to you that in the next 75 minutes, somehow there can be a kind of Bratislava initiative which can emerge. Because, as he says, uh, it's not just here in this tent on the banks of the Danube. It's further afield, and there are many who are deeply concerned about that. I want you to see this as a conversation. We're looking for ideas, please, not just uh, questions. So see it as a conversation. What I'd like to do, first of all, and there are no fixed remarks here, is uh, take the three panelists and the three main speakers through a series of issues which I think we need to address. Firstly, if, uh, if I may, Ambassador, um, from the OSCE point of view, I'm picking up really from an initiative this morning, the question which came in about the Helsinki final acts. Are they dying or almost close to death? Um, in your multinational community and your multinational organization, which you are, are trying to make sure can uphold those principles, do you see a significant amount of me first ism when you're taking on the challenges which you're trying to uphold in so many different important areas of responsibility and anxiety? Is everything going backwards or is there a, at least an acceptance of the value of a multilateral community like the one you have? But I guess it depends on, on how uh, uh, we define me first. and. And, and this could be the Bratislava initiative uh, that we uh, perhaps uh, give uh, um, uh, me first uh, an innovative forward-looking uh, meaning. But do you subscribe to it? If, it, if, it, if, it, if me first is me only or me at your expense, uh, of course, uh, we're not going uh, to get far. If me first uh, would imply that states uh, look after their uh, own interests, perhaps look after their own interests first, I would say this is normal. And uh, normal
we all interpret multilateralism in uh, our favor, in our own favor, no exclusions. Uh, and here there are our national interests, our, our foreign policy interests, our biases, our alliances, uh, etc. Besides the atmosphere for multilateralism today uh, is indeed very toxic. I shouldn't be giving you examples. And the degree of uh, confrontational rhetoric is very high. And, and uh, recent actions, uh, uh, -multi anti-multilateral elections, take the JCPOA, take the climate change, take the US uh, economic uh, for, foreign uh, international economic economy moves. They are all anti-multilateral. Of course, we can argue a lot. Uh, who started and who is the spoiler today? I can come to that later. I, I think I'll skip that uh, for the time being. But there is one uh, institution in the world which is uh, the epitome of uh, multilateralism, and this is, of course, the United Nations. With all its flaws, with all its inertia, with all the recognized uh, need uh, uh, to reform and adapt, uh, still, this is a microcosm of the world, of all nations, big or small. Um, and I, I say all the time that the United Nations or the Security Council, for that matter, cannot be better than the world itself. It just, it just reflects the agonies, the divides, and the frustrations uh, which we are living through. Uh, the, the big question, May, uh, what kind of world are we living today? Is it the same world that was created after the Second World War uh, with the United Nations uh, at its center, or are we moving to a new world order? And there is an, another thing which is very important. We are talking multilateralism, but we claim that we are already living in a multipolar world, not yet sustained and not sustainable, but definitely bipolar and unipolar worlds have gone. Uh, we live uh, new centers of power, financial, economic, uh, political, emerging. They demand their voices be heard and their interests taken into account. And one of the problems the world is facing today that uh, this cannot be accepted uh, as given and accepted with humility. So I would claim that we still live in the, in the world order that was created in 1945. We had other tectonic changes like the end of colonialism, the fall of communism, the ideological divide associated with it, the Cold War, the end of Cold War, but uh, that didn't cha change the paradigm and it shouldn't uh, change it either. But we should take into account the interests of those emerg emerging centers of power, otherwise we risk to lose the balance that the world so badly needs. Ambassador, is it a new world order? Uh, you asked the question, is it a new world order but with diluted multilateralism? Because you also said this is anti-multilateralism as well, which I'd like to hear from the other two panelists as well. But I put to you, is it a new world order with diluted multilateralism? Is that what we have to accept? Uh, no. Uh, we, we see the attempts to, to dilute uh, uh, multilateralism. And uh, as I said, we can, we can argue who started and who is the spoiler. I have my answer to that. But uh, first, I said we still live in the same world order. But of course, uh, the, the, uh, the changes that are happening in the world, that it comes from a unilateral that existed for practically two decades to multilateral, uh, to multipolar, uh, is one of the reasons uh, why uh, the old, uh, the old uh, dominion powers, dominating powers, tried to cling to the old, to the old world order. Besides, there is one country, I'm re I regret to say that, but uh, this is the case, which is non-multilateral uh, in its DNA. Uh, it has never been. This is the United States. Uh, it has never been multilateral. Uh, we can come to that a bit later, because otherwise I would take too much time, but I can explain. Well, you're putting it on the agenda, but let me just be clear, and then I'll, I'll open it up. Um, uh, again, Ambassador, and also uh, Mark, um, anti-multilateralism, and also what the Ambassador said there, we interpret multilateralism in our favor. In other words, it sounds great, maybe even coming from Mr. Lychak, but actually there's some really tough realities we have to face here. Yeah, I agree. There is this uh, tendency uh, towards bilateralist uh, approaches because uh, at first, and, and particularly in, in uh, these um, populist environments uh, that uh, we are in, 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 many, in many states, uh, these bilateralist approaches, they uh, 
perhaps at first sight uh, more uh, appealing, while multilateral uh, um, uh, approaches, they at first sound very complicated because you have to sit together, uh, you have to listen to each other, and, and then you have to uh, uh, come and jointly uh, come up uh, with responses, this takes time, etc. So, uh, but I think uh, at the same time, I think you can make a very good business case that for most of the relevant security challenges that we, that we are currently uh, facing, uh, uh, facing, there is simply no alternative than uh, a multilateral uh, approach uh, to it. Uh, does that mean a renaissance, as we've heard from Mr. Lechak? I think we have to work towards a, a renaissance, uh, but I think for this we uh, will have to make a very strong uh, business case for uh, effective multilateralism and, uh, and I agree with, with, with many of the, uh, the points that he has made. I think we have to uh, come to uh, uh, genuine dialogue again. But is it too idealistic, do you fear? No, I think it's a long term. It's achievable. It's achievable, it, it's, a, it's a vision, and we have simply no alternative than to work towards it. Uh, but right now, uh, uh, of course, uh, there are lots of challenges. It, it's, it's, it's not terribly fashionable uh, uh, multilateralism. Uh, I, I, I agree. All right. Mark, just before I come to you, who'd like to come in? Anyone want to come in? Please, down here, a microphone here as well, and here. Uh, from yeah, let's get the microphone. How many microphones we got left? I'm going to come to you. In a, I'm going to, we've got three. I'm going to come to you in one moment. But Mark, just picking up those points, uh, particularly anti-multilateralism, interpreting multilateralism in our favour, and is it really a new world order? Yeah, I, I don't think we should say that bilateralism is the opposite of multilateralism. It goes alongside each other. Multilateralism is never going to take away uh, aspects of bilateralism any more than it will take away regionalism. I think what we're seeing is a growth of some organizations, new regional organizations like the European Union, the African Union, Mercosur, uh, ASEAN, etc., built on regional groups. And we're also seeing for the first time, and this is what's new, built not actually around Russia, but more around China, some sort of rival organizations to the more traditional Western ones. And I put into that category the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, the AIIB, uh, BRICS, the One Belt, One Road, etc. So those are clearly trying to move the multilateral order in a slightly... But they are multilateral in their own but way. But they are multilateral. And the interesting thing is when I went to the United Nations, well, I found something very interesting, which surprised me, and perhaps it shouldn't have done, that at the United Nations, which is the only universal organization, the G8, as was at the time, was absolutely accepted and tolerated. It was a rich man's club, and if all the rich countries wanted to get together and talk, that was fine. What was really resented at the UN was the G20. And the reason for that was that the G20 seemed to have aspirations of world governance, and some of the traditional champions of the third world, the G77, were co-opted into a smaller grouping which undermined the sovereignty and one country, one vote nature of the UN. And that's what really upset the small countries, which of course, as you know, are in the majority of the UN. Right, thanks. Okay, let's open up. I'm just going to give you an idea of the kind of other questions which are coming through because each of them begins to feed into a, a picture of the kind of things on your mind. What could leaders do to reverse the dangerous charge to me first? From Pascal Hyman, should we allow me first as long as needed in today's world to save multilateralism long term or is that an illusion? What, and another one, what do you think the EU needs to do to truly step up the game and become a respected... Uh, it's just changed, I can't read it. Hmm. Who changed that? I don't know what the... <laughs> respected global player, I'm told. So it disappeared. Okay, um, a multilateral... Um, um, it was erased at that point. Right, let's get... Those are the kind of things which are on the minds out here. Please, um, here first and then over here. My name is Alex and keep, keep brief, you? I'm from East European Security Research Initiative for Ukraine. And that's a short uh, question. Because uh, next year, the uh, Slovak Republic is going to chair OEC. That's why, why, why not to speak a little bit about to be me first as a chair of the OEC, and then trying to combine all other OEC member states to be uh, to elaborate common ideas, to be the common core for this, let's uh, just mention Bratislava Initiative. Why not to start here just to raise some starting points for this Bratislava initiative and, and other things? Maybe to combine together all the efforts of all... Uh, 
distinguished delegations or distinguished panelists here representing UN, OEC, uh, as well as somehow EU, just to start with the uh, occupied Donbass, maybe, to move further on peacekeeping, peacekeeping forces to be deployed here, just to put forward all these ideas as not to be me first. All right, that's, th that's an important thing. Um, it's, that's a specific issue. I'm going to just bear that in mind, Donbass, if I may. J thank you very much indeed. Jonathan Isle, and then Ambassador. Um, <clears throat> Jonathan Isle from the Royal United Services Institute in London. Um, I wonder if I could ask our Russian colleague whether he thinks that the excessive use of the veto in the UN Security Council indicates a commitment to multilateralism. Thank you. I'll come back to that in a moment. Ambassador, have you got a microphone? Oh, I'll come to you in a moment in, in that case. Uh, just hang on one moment. Let's just get that, that first specific question from Rusi about whether the veto is a challenge to multilateralism. Can I? Yes. Uh, the excessive use of VITA, and the best Lyle Grant, Lyle Grant uh, would uh, confirm it, these days is not uh, a record in the UN history. There were much more excessive uses of VITA in the old days of the Soviet Union uh, and the Cold War. Uh, but we are, uh, we are accused of uh, excessively using the VITA these days. I would uh, make two points. First, uh, VITA is not a plague. VITA is a, an instrument. VITA is, a, is a, as a tool to uh, uphold balance in the world. Uh, and we are not, uh, we are not uh, ashamed to use a VITA when we deem necessary to do so. By the way, Russia uh, doesn't do anything on the international scene uh, to please or displease somebody. We do something or do not do something because we think it's right or wrong. Secondly, the excessive use of VITA recently uh, was not uh, accidental. Uh, many of those vetoes were deliberately provoked by our, by our colleagues uh, in, the, in the Council, uh, namely, I would not shy away, the P3. They knew perfectly well uh, that resolutions, some of the resolutions that they were putting forward, would be vetoed before these resolutions uh, uh, were, were agreed upon, and they knew they, they couldn't be agreed upon in the in the form that the, that uh, were presented uh, to the to the open chamber. Uh, so it was it was definitely a deliberate uh, uh, a deliberate way to expose Russia because it coincided with some political uh, political uh, arguments that we had over 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 various issues, uh, or most, most, uh, uh, most, uh, uh, most often Syria, on, on various aspects of it. Okay, thanks. Now, on the OSC, of course, you have a different way of operating. I don't think you have vetoes, do you, in the OSC? You have to have consensus. Uh, so you have a de facto veto <laughs> by every single participant. Yeah, but not, not with a red card. <laughs> but just picking up on what Jonathan I was asking uh, about how how multilateralism can work or doesn't work in that environment which you have to operate in in the OSCE. Does that give it more wiggle room or does it just lead simply to a more uh, co uh, common denominator form of policy and, uh, and, and process making? Well, let's see, uh, on the downside, uh, it has clearly become much more difficult lately to create uh, the kinds of soft norms uh, that the OEC managed to create, for instance, in the 90s. Uh, so uh, if you look at the number of decisions uh, that the OEC produces, uh, they have gone down. It has become terribly difficult to come to decisions uh, in certain dimensions, for instance, in human dimension. So uh, clearly there, the consensus rule makes it much harder to come uh, to uh, new norms. On the other side, uh, uh, once you have a, a decision, be it a policy one or be it on an operation, by consensus, you have the ownership of the 57. And this, of course, was decisive, for instance, four years ago uh, uh, in uh, uh, managing uh, the crisis in and around Ukraine. Uh, in March 2014, uh, all 57 participating states uh, um, uh, 
took a consensus decision on establishing the special monitoring mission to Ukraine, which I think was uh, uh, absolutely uh, instrumental in preventing further escalation uh, of the conflict. Can one say, therefore, that that's the flame of multilateralism, even if it takes a lot of very heavy lifting to get that kind of consensus among 57? You have then uh, uh, decisions uh, that uh, are being backed by everybody. And just imagine for a second, would a special monitoring mission uh, to Ukraine be able to do its job without uh, a consensus? No, it, it would not. It, it, that was absolute, a decisive feature. And uh, so I think it, it depends if uh, uh, key stakeholders um, come to the conclusion that we need to use one of these multilateral tools. Uh, um, well, uh, then they're out there. Uh, we can use them and, and they prove to be effective. Mark Lau Grant, on just on the technical issue of the veto, yeah. Uh, as one of the permanent five, of course, again, you're not in government anymore. You can say what you like. You don't have to explain what uh, your successors have done, Matthew Rycroft and Karen Pierce. But surely you don't use the veto tactically, do you, to trap any other members of the P5 or other members of the Security Council? Well, are you, a, are you there, defeating multilateralism? There were certainly cases where we pushed a resolution to the vote knowing that Russia would veto on Ukraine and Crimea was, was one example, some of the Syria ones as well. But... I would make two points uh, about the veto. Firstly, that the vast majority of resolutions adopted by the Security Council are by consensus, a bit like the OSCE, and that is same is true for the General Assembly. Actually, voting is relatively uh, rare, even even now with a veto. Secondly, my second point is that the veto is a necessary evil. I think it is an evil, but it is a necessary one. And it's worth just Why is it necessary? It's necessary for the reason that the League of Nations that was set up after the First World War to stop any future wars failed. Why did it fail? Because a lot of the big countries didn't join in the first place or left it straight away. So the decision taken in 1945 was that in order to bind the big powers into a multilateral universal system, you had to give them a veto when their national interest was at stake. If you took away the veto... I think Russia would leave the United Nations. I would think the United States would probably leave the United, uh, United Nations as well, frankly. So I don't think it would be sensible either to take away the veto or to extend the veto to new members of the Security Council because that would make it even more difficult to get business. Well, Ambassador, I better just check. Would you leave the Security Council if the veto was abolished? Uh, in the first place, the veto cannot... You're be among friends here. Yes, yes, I, I, I totally agree and I feel it. Uh, I, in the first place, the, the, the veto right cannot be abolished. For that, you need to change the charter, which, which is impossible. And Ambassador Lyle Greit know, know, knows that perfectly well. And I would, f we would definitely agree that uh, veto is a, is a great tool. As I said, a balancing thing. Uh, and for your information, there is a, a lot of debate on the reform of the Security Council. Where, by the way, issues of multilateralism, of multipolar world, are popping up. They are part of the discussion, and of course, the, the veto right is also part of the discussion. Uh, don't be surprised, but many countries, uh, including smaller ones, understand the need for the veto right perfectly well. They understand that this is the right that protects not only the interests of the major powers, but in certain cases, their own interests too. So I would agree that, uh, that uh, we, we wouldn't uh, go because the veto will stay. All right, fine. Uh, there are a lot of other questions coming in. This Donbass question I'd, I'd, I'd like to come back to before the end at a quarter past five because it was raised in Bobo's um, session, and we do have uh, figures here who can help move us down that track because we didn't get very far. But um, where are the microphones? There's one here with the ambassador. Who else has got the microphone? You've got a microphone too. Who's got the third one? I'm looking for a third microphone. Okay, not, 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 not visible yet. Um, before I come to you, though, there's one particular question here from Martin Polachik. What is Russia going, when is Russia going to come back to the table at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, if you believe in multilateralism? 
You should have asked that question, uh, addressed that question to Vyacheslav Nikonov, who is the, who is the, the yeah, but he's former, gone. You're here. The <laughs> former, the former uh, panelist who is uh, from the State Duma, who is uh, the one uh, that is responsible for that decision. But, uh, but uh, we, we, uh, our parliamentarians uh, felt offended by, by being stripped of the uh, of their voting rights and they considered that in, the, in these circumstances, circumstances they couldn't continue unless the uh, parliamentary assembly uh, uh, backed off and invited them with their full rights uh, so was that, was that, that a, could that be seen as an indictment of multilateralism well yes in a way yeah parliamentary multi multilateralism okay all right fine let's move on um i think alexei pushkov is here as well so that question could be asked of him who's got the microphone next you've got who's got the microphone next uh right at the back please yeah look there are a lot of men talking so if there are any women here um i'm i'm looking for gender balance you can command the rest of the session if you want please uh, Charles Tannock, uh, I'm a, an a species about to become extinct. I'm a British MEP. And uh, Sir Mark uh, described the European Union as a new, relatively new organization, I think. Maybe that's a slip of the tongue, because uh, clearly I would regard Brexit as one of the knives in the heart of multilateralism. I, mean, I regard it as a selfish and destructive act. And, I, and I'd wondered, I was going to ask also about the reform of the Security Council, what the dynamic will be in the Security Council with the EU only having one a permanent seat through France and Britain no longer being an EU voice on the Security Council. How will that interact and how can Britain stay plugged in multilaterally if we leave the European Union? We've already seen what's happened over the JCPOA where Trump's on one side and Britain's on the other. We're closely aligned to the EU in all the major issues at the moment over Syria and so on. How are we going to stay plugged in? How's it going to change? Okay, well, let's not get too UK-centric here, given what we heard from Mr. Lychak about, remember, the large number of people who are not in this room. Who's got the microphone next, please? Hi, yeah. Bart, Bart Treftick at the European Commission's European Political Strategy Centre. Thanks very much for your remarks. A question for both Ambassador uh, Nabenzi and Ambassador Lyle Grant. Um, some observers view Russia as a spoiler of the liberal order and China is a potential transformer of some sort of rules-based order, not necessarily a liberal one, but some multilateral order uh, because of its scale and uh, economic presence and military might. Um, I, I would um, ask whether you agree with that assessment or whether you would have um, other perspectives. And uh, for Ambassador uh, Nabenzi, um, what other example, concrete examples that you could cite uh, where Russia contributes to multilateralism or a global order, either through peacekeeping or development aid or refugee resettlement, anything that could be termed sort of a global public good? Or is it really uh, what uh, the critics say is mainly a spoiler of the liberal order? And for right. Ambassador Lyle Grant on China and tra transforming. Thank you. Okay. On that particular one, I mean, you've who's, served in several multi multilateral who is, organizations. Who's answering on the spoilers? Because I have said to say something about the spoilers. Who's going to answer? It's well, you can question start. To me or you can start. Okay. Uh, as I said initially, that uh, unfortunately there is one country which is not multilateral by nature, uh, and this is the United States, and there are numerous reasons why it is so, but, is, but it, it is the, the fact. If you read the U.S. Uh, national security strategy or the U.S. nuclear doctrine, you will not find a single word on multilateralism there. Uh, unlike, for example, the Russian foreign policy concept, you may you may say, for example, that Russia doesn't follow what it writes in its, in its foreign policy concept. That's uh, that's an argument that I wouldn't agree with. But uh, still, the Russian foreign foreign policy con concept is multilateral, while while the U.S. the U.S. national security strategy strategy is anti-multilateral. Uh, and it's a bit strange to me why the United States cannot live uh, without an idea of uh, looking for domination and adversaries. Uh, this time they chose four, as you know, among them Russia and China, by the way. Uh, why they cannot live in the in the spirit of uh, cooperation? I read the recently recently uh, President Trump uh, uh, referring to the former Secretary of State Dean Acheson, the late 40s, 90s, early 50s, who said that uh, U.S. can negotiate. Uh, with other partners, only from the position of strength. He was referring to the Soviet Union, meaning that uh, unless the Soviet Union uh, became weaker, there is no point negotiating. Uh, 
uh, and President Trump uh, fully embraces that that uh, that idea, both on Iran and on North Korea. And I have a question to him: Does it mean that he will never talk to Russia again? Because because uh, because Russia is getting stronger, and uh, if that if that uh, premise remains, that that means that U.S. will never engage with us. It is not already, uh, but uh, is it for good or is it uh, uh, or is it uh, temporary? So well, we look forward to his tweet tomorrow morning. Sorry. We look forward to his tweet tomorrow morning. But Ambassador Greminger, let me just pick up. I don't want to get too stuck on, on Brexit, and Mark Lyle Grant obviously can speak from a British point of view, but this issue of, of what is happening, which is the distancing of some nations, and we heard from the Institute's report from Jakob earlier that it's no longer one size fits all around Europe. Are you detecting this really very significantly, whether we call it me firstism or something much more, that the general nationalism, pushbackism, anti-establishmentism, whatever we want to call it, in Hungary, in Poland, in, in Italy and elsewhere, that is already beginning to make it much more difficult for you to oversee a multilateral consensus because it's impinging on the kind of work that the OSCE does. Uh, it, cur it certainly shapes the kind of discussions that we are having every Thursday in the Permanent Council uh, of the OEC. And uh, I think it also uh, affects uh, the climate uh, that, that we have. And, and uh, uh, I mean, what I see is uh, that these uh, more formal uh, platforms uh, of dialogue, uh, they're more and more uh, used uh, for public diplomacy, which as such uh, is perhaps necessary, uh, particularly uh, because the OEC, one of the functions of the OEC is to uh, be a, a platform to hold states accountable for uh, their respect for princ uh, to the principles and commitments of the OEC. So, so basically, uh, if there is, uh, you know, raising issues uh, regarding um, developments in, in, in Hungary, um, in the Russian Federation, in, in the Baltic states, etc., under the current issue item uh, at the Permanent Council, uh, that, that's fine. But I think uh, this will not allow uh, us to uh, um, tackle uh, some of the issues that we need to tackle. It will not allow us to rebuild trust and confidence. Mm. So this obliges us to create alternative informal spaces where there is still a possibility to conduct genuine, constructive... Is there a uh, will to do that, do you believe, or not? Uh, well, there have been attempts. I have alluded uh, to the structured dialogue. Uh, that is uh, a, a very important platform, but it is an informal platform that so far, I think, has been producing a, a very cost constructive dialogue on political military issues. And I do hope uh, that... Uh, um, in the short to medium term, it will also produce uh, concrete outcomes in terms of um, uh, military risk reduction, in terms of reinvigorating confidence secu security building measures, uh, um, uh, because this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, needed today uh, that we also come to uh, concrete measures that uh, address uh, uh, concrete challenges of today and I think uh, by doing so uh, we'll, we'll manage to achieve two things. Uh, incrementally we will manage to rebuild some of the trust and confidence that has been lost uh, in uh, recent years and I think we will uh, also manage to showcase that uh, effective multilateralism um, um, is indeed uh, in the enlightened self-interest of states. Right. <clears throat> I'm still trying to push for the multilateral renaissance that we heard from uh, Mr. Lychak. Mark, just before I, just, I come to you, who's got the microphones? One here, Ambassador. Who else has got? There are two more hiding somewhere. Who's sitting on them? Um, could you move that along to Bobo, please, that one you've got there? Who else has got the third one? Who's got the third one? Because I want one over here, please. Um, if you could bring the microphone over here. Right, um, just picking up on those, those points, we've got 25 minutes to run uh, to uh, create the renaissance in multilateralism by quarter past five. Uh, in that case, I won't talk about Brexit now, we can deal with that afterwards. The only point I would make on that is it won't make uh, a, a bit of difference to Britain's position at the UN Security Council. 
Um, the EU did not dictate the position that the United Kingdom and France take uh, in the UN Security Council anyway, um, but the positions that we hold, as we've seen in the decisions that have been taken by the government in the last few weeks, whether on the Iran deal or on trade issues, etc., aren't going to change just because the American position, for instance, uh, has shifted. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I want to pick up on the China point, because I think this is important, and we haven't talked a lot about uh, uh, China uh, today. Because in my time at the United Nations, one of the most difficult things I found to explain to London was the minimal role that China played in the UN Security Council. Russia, in my five and a half years, probably came up with 50 to 100 initiatives in the Security Council. Most of them deeply unhelpful, of course, but one or two were constructive, you know, on piracy and things like, things like that. But I cannot think of a single initiative by China in five and a half years. The Chinese PR would talk about stability, sovereignty, non-interference, dialogue, whether he was talking about Syria or Cote d'Ivoire. It didn't make a blind bit of difference. Basically the same script. And this was a surprise because, you know, in any uh, objective assessment of geopolitical standings, you know, China's going up, Russia may be relatively going down. I mean, China's got an economy ten times the size of Russia now. But... The, the, one of the anachronisms of the UN Security Council, and there are many, is that Russia is the dominant of the two forces. To the extent that China vetoed a number of resolutions, in, particularly on Syria, which they were perfectly happy with, but they had a strategic understanding with Russia at the highest level that they would support Russia uh, in vetoing those resolutions. Now, the interesting thing is I mentioned this as the backdrop because it may be about to change. And we're beginning to see a little bit of more Chinese investment in the multilateral system, that of the permanent members, they are rather the largest contributor to UN peacekeeping operations. They're putting a lot of money into peacekeeping operations. They're beginning to put forward credible candidates for senior positions in international organizations. And we've seen President Xi talking at Davos and elsewhere about filling the gap left by President Trump on climate and free trade, etc. Now, is this for real? I very difficult to tell. Um, I did examine uh, China. Did they have some global plan that they were going to unveil once they'd overtaken America economically? I didn't get any sense of it uh, from New York, right. but it might uh, be there. And I think that's a very interesting question. If it happens, though, they will do it from a different values base from the current liberal international order. Are there any Chinese delegates here? Uh, I might come to you in a moment on that. May I? Yeah, Ambassador, you wanted to come in. Just uh, let me just tell you, we've got 23 minutes now to run. There's going to be a renaissance in short remarks and also in short questions. I, I just wanted to pick up what Ambassador Lyle Grant was saying. I will not argue about the validity and the, uh, of, our, of our initiatives. Uh, we can argue outside of this room, <laughs> but uh, on, China, on China, China is very important. Yeah, we have, to, we have to take into account that UN and multilateralism is very important to China. China verbalizes it differently. Yes, uh, China speaks differently. Uh, China doesn't, do, do, is not in a hurry, by the way. Uh, they, they take their time, unlike uh, some of our, some of us from the Western civilization. <laughs> they are great civilization too, but uh, they, they do it differently. Uh, and it's uh, not easy always for us to, to translate. But uh, when they speak, they mean it, uh, even if we do not see the, the, new, in, the new instance. But, but UN and multilateralism is extremely important for China as a safeguard of its, of its role in the world, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the omen of their, of their uh, significance. Uh, All right. Let me, we've got a Chinese delegate. Do you want to respond on that, to what you heard from Mark Lau Grant and also the ambassador? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, you talk a touch about uh, China. I think that China's rising actually benefited two things. One is China's domestic reform. Another is globalization. But multilateralism. Multilateralism. Please. Actually, globalization and multilateralism so closely uh, each other. And also, I think the free, uh, free, order, uh, free world order is so important for China. Without it, China cannot economic rise so quickly. So actually, China respected very much. In the United Nations, I think, of course, China looks like keep law profile for a long time. That's not only China's uh, that's position, keep law profile. Actually, China's rising economically so quickly, but we are still 
not learn to how can be a big power. So I think China is a learner. We we are in in past forty years we learned a lot from United Kingdom, Russia, United States. But today why we talk me first? This is of course in in, in term of uh, sovereignty. Every country should be me first. But today's world already changed it's because uh, we are facing so many global challenge and the globalized world means. All, all the nations interdependent so deeply, we have to cooperate with each other. So I, I think China is a learner. But the other I, part of the question is, is it China, me only? No, I think the world, free world order is important, not for only for today's China, even for future China. Thank you. Now, uh, we've got 20 minutes to run. I know five or six of you want to speak, so please keep your remarks relatively short, please. And I will start looking at you hard if you're going on too long. Ambassador. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm Brendan Hammer. I'm the Australian Ambassador in Vienna, and I'm accredited to uh, 12 international organisations, including the OSCE. So I live and breathe multilateralism. And um, Is it alive and kicking? It's very much alive and kicking, and um, my colleagues and I are talking a lot about how to revitalise the system, make it work better, and I just want to share some ideas towards this renaissance that you're looking for. I think there are a couple of practical things that can be done, and I'll just go through them very quickly. One is... We need to be careful who we choose to lead our international organisations, and I mean across the world, not just in Europe. We need charismatic leaders. I think UNSG Guterres is, is, is good on this front. But right across the board, <laughs> people who are skilled in promoting their organisations and all the good work they do, and there's so much good work that goes unpublicised, as Ambassador Lyle Grant mentioned. And then the agencies and organisations themselves need to be given money earmarked for their own self-promotion the promotion of what they do in the world, because at the moment they don't have such money, they're skint for money, so they don't self-promote on all the great things like fighting um, human trafficking, drug crime, uh, a, a huge range of things which most people don't know is, is going on. So, and then they need more money full stop. There are a bunch of countries, the liberal democratic countries, that are stuck on zero nominal growth for funding, for funding in the... Um, in the UN agencies, and it just won't work. The world's becoming more complex and more difficult, so we need to actually put more money into the agencies. And then last, um, I think uh, Minister Lachak mentioned um, scripted speeches behind closed doors um, by stuffy diplomats. Well, part of that's true, but... Do you recognise that? I do. Uh, but but what, uh, what we do and what a number of other countries do and are increasingly doing and that we should encourage people to do is I tweet segments of speeches as they go out and we put the entire speech or statement on our internet website within a couple of days. And, and the reaction is what? It's good. We, 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 we talk on DPRK, Iran, Crimea, all of these things. In one case, I put out a statement on the DPRK. It had done a test, the CTBT organisation um, called an emergency meeting. It was in the middle of the night, Canberra time. I made a statement. The statement went straight into the Australian media. The next day, the Foreign Minister was asked a question in the House about what I'd said, to which she answered she had instructed me to make the statement which I made. But there you are. So it really... It really was that true? Um, no comment. <laughs> anyway, Sounds like yes to me. Yeah, and it came... It, um, it, so it really, that really does work. All right. We need to think of ways to publicise what we do. Thank you very much indeed. I'll come to that about the reality of this and how this can be managed within, significant, within large multilateral organisations. Let me go to Bobo, and there are two over here. Can I take the microphone, Ambassador? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> just picking up on Chinese foreign policy, I think actually we are seeing a radical globalisation of Chinese foreign policy, but it's a process that really has started only very recently, pretty much since Xi Jinping became uh, China's uh, paramount leader in 2012. That's only a few years ago. Give it time. I think this, this, this space is changing extremely rapidly. But the point I wanted to ask you uh, really was, uh, I see something of a veto dilemma or a security council dilemma. I completely take your point, Mark Lyle Grant, about if you had more people exercising the veto, gosh, it would be even, even more deadlocked than it already has been. On the other hand, the world is changing very rapidly. As, as Vyacheslav Nikonov said in the last panel, it's not just Russia, China, the United States. There are, there's India, for example. So 
isn't there a problem of credibility? I appreciate you don't want more people, more countries exercising the veto. You don't want a bloated UN Security Council. On the other hand, if you want a multilateralism that's fit for purpose in the late 21st, in the second half of the 21st century, even in the first half of the 21st century, then you need to be giving much more uh, multilateral um, prestige, status, influence to countries like India and Indonesia, and there are many others. Thanks, Bobo. Okay, please here and here. Yeah, just a quick question. John Hudson with the Washington Post. A uh, question for Ambassador Nabendia. Um, uh, is, is there literally nothing that you and your American counterpart, uh, Ambassador Haley, could work on in a multilateral fashion, modest, small, uh, pragmatically at the Security Council? And you two say you know, very nasty things about each other publicly te on television. What is your working relationship? What's your personal relationship with Ambassador Haley like? What's it like when you bump into her in the corridor? We kiss. Mm. You're on the record. I was recorded many times over. Okay. It, was, it was published in the Russian press. And the very is this a new form of diplomacy? Uh, look, what, what kind of diplomacy we have today, that's a separate issue, which, no, no, I, I must answer, yeah. because th that is, that is uh, one of the problems that we live in uh, what, what is called the post-truth world. I read it in the New York Times in, re in relation to Trump affair. Truth is not a very welcome co commodity these days. <laughs> we, we live in, 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 the, in, the, in the platter of fakes, various kinds. We, we, th that is a long discussion that we might engage, but... Uh, uh, I, I wanted to answer the question that uh, Washington Post asked me about. We, we cooperate on many things with the U.S. You know, you see uh, on the screen on the radar only where we, uh, all, only where we fight. Besides, we don't say na nasty things about each other. We try to say uh, nasty things about our policies. But the atmosphere of the of the people in the Security Council outside the Security Council room uh, is uh, friendly. We really are friends. We we uh, we uh, made a commitment pledge and and uh, and an oath that we do not uh, we do not take our differences, political differences. Uh, so there's hope the for multilateralism in the remain, corridors. Remain people there. All right, thanks. Admiral. Giampaolo Di Paolo from Italy. Um, I make it a point that the present structure of Security Council does not conducive to a more effective, to more renaissance of a multilateralism, to pick your point. It will not. And second, and this goes to the British and the Russian ambassador, the P5 veto power today reflect a me only mentality. Because you ambassador, if, if I not misunderstood, you said that P5 veto power was reflecting 1945 structure. Today is definitely not there and we want to retain as it is. Thank and you very much. And the logic. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes to run. That, the intervention from China was really very important. But I'd like to pick up what the Australian ambassador said. Just pick up the practicalities of how you change the image of multi, uh, multilateralism by the people you appoint, the money they get, and so on. Is this pie in the sky? Is it imagination? Or is there something more, given the imperative of who has to be appointed and the national demands and so on? Does that mean the kind of thing that the ambassador is talking about to improve the prospects for multilateralism are really very difficult to achieve? All three of you, Ambassador. I mean, there is clearly a challenge to market better what we do. And, and that is particularly uh, challenging when it comes to um, activities in the realm of preventing conflict. It's difficult, you know, to argue you have prevented the conflict by having anticipated inter-ethnic tensions, having approached the issue through uh, your national, uh, um, your, your high commission on national minorities. Uh, that, that is, uh, I think, that that is a big challenge. I mean, the OEC had a huge uh, uh, marketing problem. Uh, ironically, before the biggest crisis in European security broke out, the crisis in and around Ukraine, until uh, that. Uh, you, the OEC was practically disappeared from the political uh, radars uh, of decision makers in the OEC area. This problem has uh, partly disappeared, but only only partly. I think marketing what we do, uh, what we do through our institutions, our field operations, uh, that remains a, a big channel challenge. We have to become better in, in that. Uh, if we want to make the business case for effective multilateralism, I think uh, it is also very much about uh, 
um, it, it, marketing is one important aspect. But of course, uh, we also need to be seen dealing with issues that make a difference for states, uh, and and, uh, and and we need to deliver. And, and okay. uh, Mark uh, and, is, ambassador. and also the other issue yeah. that uh, Brandon alluded to, uh, resources. I mean, uh, he has clearly a point that uh, if you live 10 years on zero nominal growth and at, at the same time you double your operational uh, business uh, by uh, running, uh, uh, in addition, a special monitoring mission to Ukraine, I mean, uh, you come to uh, the limits of, of what is possible as, a, as an international organization. Right, just the practicalities of this, that particular point from the ambassador about there's an image problem, there's a reputation problem, there's a resource problem, and that would be better if there was a much more visible, um, uh, approachable, uh, tangible kind of person, literally a person. Do you think that's relevant, Mark? Yeah, I think the point the ambassador makes about the quality of leadership of these international organizations is, is really very important. Not bug in I mean, terms. Even when it comes to the UN Secretary General, whether you get a good UN Secretary General or not is more chance than good judgment. Uh, happily, I think we have got a very good Secretary General at the moment, but that hasn't always been the case uh, in the past. It's not easy because you do have to have regional balance. You've got to take those into account because you've got to have credibility in terms of uh, a whole range of uh, diversity, uh, etc. And at the same time, you've got to have really competent people running it, because without that, multilateralism is not going to be successful, I agree. I just want to add a point about Security Council. But what about the lobbying from national capitals for, for particular people, because of whatever reason? Well, that's inevitable. Um, some of them are by election, and some of them are by appointment. But either way, yes, there is a certain amount of lobbying. Um, and it's actually a good thing to bind countries into the multilateral system if they have senior officials seconded or in upper reaches of the different organizations. So yes, I did spend some time in New York lobbying for British candidates uh, in elections, whether it's judges at the ICJ or it's senior appointments at the UN, because it's in Britain's interest to have people there, but it's also, we think, in the wider interest to have highly competent people there. And your other point? On Security Council reform, you're absolutely right, and I I personally, and the British government more importantly, is strongly in favour of Security Council reform, and has been, but not necessarily the extension of the veto, that's my point. We can certainly widen the Security Council and bring in uh, a lot of the new powers, but if we introduce the veto more widely, then I think we'll make life very difficult. But I would just back up what Vasily said a minute ago, that as a reassurance, the UN is highly compartmentalized. So you can be shouting at each other across the Security Council chamber on Ukraine in the morning, but you may be cooperating on the DRC or South Sudan or whatever in the afternoon. So there is a responsibility, particularly the permanent members, to make the system work the best it can, despite the fundamental differences that may be. Ambassador, quickly. Uh, I agree on the need to reform the Security Council. It's our official position. We agree that it does not represent the new powers of the world. That relates to this uh, multilateralism via vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, multipolarism, the new one. Uh, that should be reflected, but uh, but that should be that should be done very carefully. And there are a lot of contradictions over it, not between the P5, but among the mem it marks the wider membership. Uh, multilateralism is there. I mean, it's in the charter. It's in the chat of the United Nations since 1945. The problem is that we, we, we do not implement it uh, how it is written. It's all about their sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, peaceful settlement of deep disputes, etc. Uh, the, the last thing, uh, and that to translate, that means to, to respect each other. The last thing I would like to say, there is a phrase here in the preface to our panel, U.S. as the peer, pillar of multilateralism is still struggling to reinvent itself. I've been with the U.N. practically all my career life, and I, I've been reinventing it many times over. Uh, so far I failed, uh, and I'm not sure that we have to reinvent it, but, uh, but make it better uh, the way our founding fathers uh, made the institutions work uh, back then in 1945. Let me now turn it on its head. We've got four minutes left, and I'm picking up that question about Donbass which came up in Bobo Lowe's um, uh, session as well from Wolfgang Ischinger. Now look, uh, I realize I, I'm opening a bit of a hornet's nest here, but quickly, quickly if you can, given that he said that would be a clear signal of what might be achievable, dot, 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 in something like a multilateral organization, 
is an, uh, something like an operation into Donbass, is that something which would reaffirm and give more confidence that multilateralism can work or not? This is about the, the, the organizational challenge as opposed to the political challenge. Ambassador. I mean, fact is that uh, we are in a political impasse uh, when it comes to implementing the Minsk agreements. Um, now, if uh, a, a UN operation produces a political dynamic that would allow us uh, to come out of this impasse, why not? But I think uh, we should be uh, uh, careful in not uh, seeing a, a, multi a, a peace operation as a shortcut. Uh, at the end of the day, we will still have to implement the Minsk agreements. And for this, you need the political uh, will, political commitment of the sides. There is no way around this. And no multilateral organization, neither the UN nor the OEC, can substitute for the lack of poli political will. And again, Ambassador, um, whether it be Donbass or it be elsewhere in the world, the view from Moscow of the, va the value of potentially something, I, I say I'm opening a hornet's nest here, but the principle principle of some kind of multi, multilateral um, commitment in places like that, new places where there isn't one at the moment, would that reaffirm a move towards a multilateral renaissance? Uh, we, we are trying to do it multilaterally. The normal format is multilateral. Uh, uh, but the, the existential problem is that uh, uh, people say the key to this solving the, the, the problem is in Moscow, while, while we think that it is in Kyiv. Uh, many people uh, are referring to, to Minsk agreements, uh, but uh, I would strongly recommend to, re to re read uh, those Minsk agreements, uh, because there, from there you will see who should do what. And if you read it carefully, you will understand uh, who is responsible for, for the situation that we are now. Uh, we are strongly willing to finish this conflict because it is unnecessary, it is protracted, it is not, uh, it is not uh, bringing us uh, any dividends, unlike what... Uh, but the multilateral thought. response, the multilateral possibilities... It, 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 uh, it can be re solved in a multilateral context, right. uh, okay. and, but, but there, there should be a political will on on some certain sides. Right, Mark, you have the luxury of being answerable to nobody. So what's your view of whether something like this would indicate a new strength on multilateralism? Okay. Quickly, if you can. You can talk about a UN peacekeeping operation in the Donbass, but you have to, as I think Wolfgang Ischinger said earlier, have a common basis of the facts at the start. And of course, Russia would quite like a UN peacekeeping operation, but they want it to freeze the current border, which is their border between Donbass and the rest of Ukraine. The rest of the international community would want that to be actually policing the international border and to stop Russia supporting the dissidents in, in eastern Ukraine. So that won't be resolved, and therefore I don't think a UN peacekeeping operation is a starter. The Minsk agreements, however, are a good example of multilateralism. It was an agreed smaller group working on behalf of the international community. What the Minsk uh, agreements did was endorsed by the UN Security Council, so has... You know, it's a very good example of regional solutions being endorsed by the global organization. The problem is they haven't been implemented. Thank you all very much indeed. Have we created a renaissance here, the beginnings of a Bratislava initiative? You'll make your own judgments. I think there's a seed or two which has been sown, but it, I think we've highlighted how difficult it's going to be. Let me just give you uh, two bits of management. Um, refreshments available inside the hotel. Uh, if you want to come back, uh, be here for the next session in half an hour, 1745, on moves towards a European defence union. Um, and upstairs in Mary Teresa, uh, the subject is economic transition to the post oil era. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to you. A lot of questions. Delighted. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.